Today, guys, we're going to be going over the 10 big changes coming in the Witch Queen. These are by far the most substantial changes coming. And I really try to consolidate everything into a nice, clean list here. But understand, the girth of all the changes that are coming this week is staggering. Between sandbox, content, overall shakeups, the thickness of Savathun, this expansion is looking to be very juicy. Now, before we really deep dive into this video, we got to bring up our sponsorship, and that is NordVPN. Fellas, Savathun is already still in our lights. Do not let her steal your browsing history. Today, guys, we are partnering with NordVPN for today's video. NordVPN allows you to stay anonymous on the internet, so you don't have to worry about invaders, hackers, or anyone trying to maliciously get your information. It's also super easy to use. Literally just one click and boom you're secure. NordVPN will also keep your info safe from the prying eyes of your own internet provider. This month NordVPN is actually doing something pretty cool. They're turning 10 years old in February and they'll be sending gifts to all buyers. With the purchase of a two-year plan you'll receive one month free along with a special gift. That being either one month, one year, or two years of subscription on top of that with also a 30-day money-back guarantee. Guys if you're interested head on over to NordVPN.com slash to start securing yourself today. With that being said, let's touch on change number one, weapon crafting. This has by far been the biggest selling point of this expansion and rightfully so. Destiny has always been an RNG based game, meaning when you kill a boss, they drop a weapon and you just pray to the RNG gods that it has the perks and roles that you want. But as we know, RNG is oh so fickle, which is why Bungie is giving us weapon crafting. And we're going to be able to do things like craft all of the new weapons going forward and then eventually be able to go back and craft even older weapons in the later seasons of this year. But you're also going to be able to craft exotics, the new weapon type, the glaive. And what's even more interesting about the crafting is that eventually you can unlock enhanced traits. These are literally better traits than what we currently have. Now, we don't know to what degree. I'm hoping that things like Rampage, Kill Clip, and Multi Kill Clip, and a lot of the damage perks that we saw back in Shadowkeep actually got a nerf and a damage reduction. These enhanced traits could actually be an undoing of that, or it could just be a slight stat bump in tandem them with that trait. Regardless though, this is going to give us control over our loot. And in quotes here, once a weapon is crafted, guardians may begin to increase its level by using it in activities and defeating enemies. That's right guys, the more you use a weapon, the more you unlock new traits from it, new combinations, and eventually be able to craft that perfect god roll. Which by the way, at any moment, you can stop and reshape depending on the activity you're going into. Weapon crafting is by far the biggest selling point here, fellas, for both new players and veteran players. And if you're wondering how the hell this process even works, we've already seen a little bit of it. But to be honest with you guys, this week we'll be crafting everything we can live. We're going to be jumping into that immediately, trying to figure out the best ways to optimize weapon crafting to grant us all of the gun rolls we could ever need. Now, change number two, Void 3.0. This is a complete overhaul to our light-based subclasses. And they're starting with Void with the launch of Witch Queen. And then eventually next season, they're going to be doing Arc 3.0, and in the next season, they'll be doing Solar 3.0. Essentially, guys, they're taking what we currently have, which is our light subclass trees, and then converting them to our stasis layouts, aspects, fragments, giving every grenade option to all the other void subclasses. Meaning if you're a hunter, you can rock suppressor grenades. And we don't know to what extent these fragments and these aspects are going to reach to, but supposedly at some point, our fellow Titans may actually be able to use Devour. Although what Bungie has stated about Void 3.0 and pretty much every 3.0 version of these subclasses is that the identity and themes of each one of the classes will still be preserved. But if other subclasses can use them, it won't be as potent. So if you're looking to just be a sneaky boy, well then obviously being an invis hunter is still the way to go. Regardless Regardless though, Void 3.0 is a huge shakeup. It's going to change the way the game plays. And what Bungie is really trying to do here is to make all of our previous light subclasses feel outdated. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen. We did an entire video breakdown of all the Void changes covered from the podcast where Bungie was actually giving us some details on that. If you want to check that video out, it's a very long one. There were some buffs and even some nerfs mentioned in there. Regardless though, the main thing is we're going to have the freedom to choose how exactly we want to mix up our light subclasses, which is the customization that we essentially had back in Destiny 1. Let's hope it's even better than that, though. Change number three, a new destination. What's a big expansion without a new destination? Fellas, we've had new destinations before. Dreaming City was one of the most standout destinations for me. The Dreadnought is another. Europa, snowy. It was really Bungie's way of trying to figure out, hey, how extreme can we get with the conditions, right? Can we make the Guardian feel like they're literally in a blizzard? The Witch Queen 
it's taking a more grander approach, which is like this castle in the sky. And we actually talked with Mylan a while back, and we questioned whether or not Savathun, which by the way, she used the light to create this newer version of the throne world. And you can see it sitting almost on top of these swamps. That's to indicate the old throne world in a way. And then this grand castle represents the new. And in some ways, considering Mylan mentioned that this is actually being built from Savathun's memories, this could actually be similar to where Savathun grew up, at least the architecture and design. Again, she grew up in Fundament with her two sisters. And what we know about Savathun is that her connection with her family is very dear to her. So much so that she was actually the one to take on the White Worm after her father's passing. Again, if you're interested in the entire lore breakdown of all of this, we did a video with Noja as well as Mylan going over lore. Feel free to check that out. Regardless, new destination looks amazing. The question is, has everything Bungie's done up to this point with the dynamic weather systems from Europa to the grandness of the Dreaming City, will that find its way into Savathun's throne world? I think it will, fellas. Moving on to change number four. This is actually a change to the campaign. Now, I think many of us, when we think of Destiny, we never go, oh, the campaign experience was amazing. No, most of us run through the campaign so that we can get to in-game content. However, this time around, Bungie has added a legendary campaign, which they mentioned is going to be very difficult, and it's also going to scale depending on how many members you have in your fire team. Now, you can still run the classic campaign, which is just the base campaign, but legendary offers more of a challenge as well as guaranteed 1520 power upon completion. You'll also be getting double rewards throughout and I almost feel like Bungie's trying to turn back to when they used to give us these epic campaigns from Halo, right? Bungie's been improving on the storytelling. They've definitely been improving on in-game content, core playlists, etc. But where they have lacked and something that reviewers have said for a long time is they just don't feel that engaged to the campaign. I think a legendary campaign will offer a difficulty that many reviewers and new players may very much enjoy. And I feel like if you can get through the legendary campaign, jumping into in-game content won't be as daunting of a task. The one thing that I have not seen is whether or not legendary campaign may have additional cutscenes or not, because that is a huge reason for doing legendary campaigns, especially like in the old Halo games, right? The additional cutscenes, etc. Now, change number five. One thing you're probably going to notice immediately in the campaign, as well as trailers, is yes, Hive have obtained light powers. Now, just to get you up to date, Savathun, who we call Savathic, was imprisoned in a cocoon, of which Marasov thought she could control, and we were essentially going to do an exorcism that would rip the worm from her body, thus making her mortal. Turns out out, Savathun gave us the worm and took the light. And not only did she take light powers, she gave them to her hive. And now they're called the Lucent Brood. Now these hive guardians or whatever, they are going to be actually moving, popping supers. It's going to feel like playing against other players. And we actually see this amazing set of clips from the most recent launch trailer in which we see 1v1s occurring between us and the Lucent Brood. Now when we actually kill these Lucent Brood, we have to follow through. We have to kill their ghosts. Because if we don't, that hive guardian Guardian will just continue to keep being revived by his ghosts over and over. The interesting thing here is, are we going to have any issues with killing these hive ghosts, right? It's not like this light was modified and even mentioned by Mylan. It's not as if Savathun took the light, but actually figured out a way to be blessed by the light, to be chosen by the traveler. At least that's what we're assuming here, which means the hive ghosts that we kill, they may have personalities similar to our own ghosts, which I got to say, I mean, I mentioned it last week, but when we're killing ghosts, in front of our own ghosts? You gotta wonder what they're thinking. They're probably like, yo, I need to get another job. This work environment is hostile. But either way, taking on these Lucent Brood definitely is gonna present arguably the most challenging experience considering the light-based abilities and even modifications to light-based abilities that they will have present. Now, change number six. We mentioned it a second ago that it's gonna be one of the first weapons we craft, the Glaive. Now, this is a completely new weapon type and it will be the first first person melee weapon. Now that's significant because when you use a sword, you're in third person, but this is quite literally going to be from the first person point of view. Now there's multiple different attacks for the glaive. You can use its heavy attack. It even has a range attack and its melee attack. Now the range attack does require you to lead your shots and the glaive even has a shield function where you can quite literally shield you and your fellow guardians. Probably the most interesting thing about the glaives though are the class specific glaives. There will actually be three exotic glaives that's really going to change the game here. The Titan glaive can poop out an entire bubble. The Warlock glaive can heal surrounding guardians. And the Hunter glaive can send out these shock waves of arc damage. Very similar to things like Trinity Ghoul and such. Either way it goes, the glaive has been something Bungie's been parading for months now. And I think it's going to be a pivotal piece in taking down Savathun. Change number seven. Let's talk about loot real quick. We are getting 50 new weapons this expansion. 
expansion. 50. We have never gotten that much ever. Now, eight of those are actually going to be exotic weapons, which includes things like Osseo Striga, Grand Overture, which will be a machine gun that shoots out all those rockets, Parasite, which is quite literally a worm grenade launcher, and two more exotics we don't know of yet. Regardless, that leaves 42 other weapons being legendaries, which is an unheard of amount of weapons coming in an expansion. On top of that, for armor, we're actually going to be getting two new exotic armor pieces per class, which by the way, you can check out in this video right here. We go over all the perks and traits found on these exotics on top of what builds can synergize well here. Now, speaking of all the new weapons that are coming, a substantial amount of them are actually going to be replacing the new role loot pool. And this loot pool is going to consist of foundry weapons. We're also going to have origin weapons, depending on where they drop from. Crucible, Gambit, and the Vanguard. Now, the significance here is that all of these weapons will have intrinsic perks, depending on where they drop from and what foundry they are from. And you're even going to have the option to select between either one of those. Now, these origin traits are quite literally the reason why we're calling this weapons 3.0 they are going to replace everything and i mentioned a couple weeks ago that this is essentially sunsetting but if i had to choose a way in which to sunset weapons this is the way to do it present me with better options bungie now if you're interested in knowing what each one of these foundries are amelon soros nadir hockey tex mechanica all these different foundries we did a deep dive into the lore of each of them it's pretty interesting because a lot of the origin traits that Bungie's pulling from leans into the identity of those actual foundries. These traits are going to make a big difference on our weapons. And considering many of us inside of Destiny are perfectionists, we're going to want that increase in our stats or that bump there in damage against certain targets or that piece of trials loot that's going to make our weapon even deadlier in 1v1 scenarios. Now change number nine. Guys, for the longest time, we've seen many exotic primaries underappreciated in PvE content, especially in-game PvE content but no more. We are going to be seeing a 40% buff for our exotic primaries. Now, this also includes trace rifles, and there even is some other archetypes that are going to be getting individual buffs on top of that. Regardless, though, exotic primary weapons are going to be doing 40% more damage. 40%! Which means in that Grandmaster Nightfall, you might actually put away that exotic heavy and break out that Ace of Spades or that Graviton Lance, or that Tiku's Divination. And I know some of us were already using those, but this means it's just going to get nastier. A 40% buff is nothing to sneeze at. And considering it's a 40% buff as a blanket buff across all exotic primaries is incredible. And if you like to use Trace Rifles, which I do too, Ruinous Effigy, as well as Agra Scepter are both going to be great options to go into in this next season. Now, finally, change number 10. This is actually two different changes that are coming to our artifact. Number one, no longer are we going to be limited to a select amount of mods we can unlock on a single artifact. Bungie actually mentioned as the season progresses and you gain more and more experience, you will be able to unlock every single artifact mod on an artifact. This is extremely significant because number one, you don't have to reset anymore. Number two, think about all the low cost artifact mods that you can now slot, especially in armor pieces like the average armor where you have that extra mod slot. I know there is a situation in which certain artifacts are way too expensive and you can't combine them with others however with this change unlocking every single artifact will give us the freedom to play with that to figure out what we can and can't match up and to perfect our builds even more and the second thing about an artifact that's pretty cool we can actually use it we even see a cutscene where a lot of people thought it was a lance like a diamond lance we were using no that was our artifact now to what extent can we use our artifact i'm not sure but it's gonna be pretty dope to just use it at all especially in such an offensive way but despite that the change that i'm most excited for with our artifact is just the ability to unlock every single artifact mod so guys those are our 10 big changes you're probably wondering cross where's the gambit changes those were pretty big. Yeah, there's just a lot of changes there. And yes, Gambit is getting a bunch of changes, actually. And I know a lot of people are arguing whether or not it's significant changes or if it's just quality of life changes. In my opinion, even the most subtle quality of life changes can be significant changes. And Gambit is getting some pretty nice changes that may actually get us to finally start playing Gambit again, which is why we have to include it into the bonus list right here. But there is a ton of changes, fellas, that I know we didn't touch on, such as like sniper rifle aim assist changes, the fusion rifle buff, the special ammo drops being reduced, Bubba now only giving 25% more damage instead of 35%. All of this, we're going to be covering this week on Twitch, guys. We're going to be going over every one of these live, touching on all this stuff as we begin to go through all the content. Regardless, though, Witch Queen is looking very, very good. Well, fellas and ladies, thank you all for coming and watching, and as always, slap that like button like your mama told you right.